and welcome to episode 18 of the EMS Handoff Podcast. This is David Blevins, and along with my co-hosts, Bradley Dean and Eric McCullough, we are your source for all things EMS. And tonight, we welcome another distinguished, I want to question that word distinguished after our last few minutes, you know, but a next distinguished guest, we're going to set him up for either success or failure here. Uh, that is bringing a topic that uh, is is awesome because we're talking about it pretty much with all of our patients, uh, whether we know it or not. So we're going to go to the fro frozen tundra, and we're not talking about up north. We're going to Middle Tennessee, who is like representing straight Wisconsin style with ice and snow. Uh, Eric, trying to do the social media from uh you know at least y'all kept electricity man what's up yeah we did uh my brother my, my family in texas did not um i've been i'm sore um you don't need a crossfit you don't need those you don't need brosolini brosovich muscles from that you can you can get one inch of ice and try to get that off of your your driveway using garden tools because we're not equipped for this kind of weather here in tennessee to get that out so that has not been a very fun ordeal, um, and it didn't melt near enough like I thought it was going to. Well, just to let you know, our, our kids have enjoyed some late school days and even days off, and we've had absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. So, all right. Well, let's go to the other side and see how uh, Brad and is uh, doing over there in North Carolina. What? Going great. Um, been cold for the last few days. Of course, all week last week it didn't do anything but rain. Uh, a little bit of ice, but mostly rain. So um, today was a, a warm, beautiful day. That's uh, it was. I'd be surprised. You know, we're right between two lakes, and uh, the number of boats heading out. We're, my wife and I are like, it's still just a tiny bit too cold uh, to be out on the lake. But uh, we did see those out. So. Uh, before we introduce our guest uh, this evening, we'd like to thank our podcast partner, the Journal of Emergency Medical Services. They've been a tremendous partner to the EMS Handoff podcast. While the EMS Handoff serves as your source for all things EMS, in the podcast verse, GEMS has been an industry leader in the profession for many years. Go by their website and support their efforts to keep the industry informed and also to check out our fellow podcast hosts as well. Gems has been exp expanding their podcast platform recently as well. Uh, and we now on Apple, Google, and Spotify. And you can also check us out on ours uh, online at YouTube as well. So check the video out there. So additionally, we'd like to uh, introduce you to our EMS handoff merchandise line with our apparel partner, Pursue Outfitters. The EMS handoff podcast is partnered with Pursue Outfitters to offer a line of comfortable and stylish EMS handoff gear. I'm representing, Eric's representing, Bradley is just kind of, you know, not today. You know, don't, don't know what that's all about, but we got a stylish EMS handoff gear, t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, and even hoodies uh, for your wear. We'd love to see those pictures on our social media. Uh, don't forget to put that out there. It's pursueoutfitters.com front slash EMS handoff to find the color of your choice. And now, after all that, Bradley, it's time to get started. Well, I, so I have to add, I did wear my hoodie last night in the woods to stay warm. Um, so I don't have it on tonight. We were out doing some additional uh, education last night with land navigation with some search teams. So um, it kept me warm, so I couldn't wear it tonight. So falsifying the narratives is a bad thing. We talked about that in documentation. We're coming up later on another episode. Don't falsify. Right. <laughs> so... Um, so tonight we've got a wonderful guest with us. Um, we have a flight medic, uh, from Minneapolis, um, who is well known within the EMS community for lots of different things. So, uh, he's a flight paramedic from Minneapolis and an educator for foam frat. We've got uh, Tyler Christopher with us tonight. Tyler, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, man. Thanks guys so much for having me on. How's everybody doing? Good. Well, you know, we're not in Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah. Bradley, or uh, Eric may think he is, but he's not. No, no, you guys got a good thing going on here. I'm happy to be on the uh, the podcast, and I appreciate you guys asking me to uh, to pop on. All right. So today we're going to talk about the single most fun-filled topic that everybody goes to paramedic school for. Just this one topic. 
<laughs> if this wasn't there, nobody would ever go to the paramedic programs. This is what it is, right, Tyler? Man, so so how disappointed were you guys when I said I wanted to talk about acid base? <laughs> so I'll, as, I'll, I'll put it this way. As soon as Bradley sent it to us, I was like, um, you're going to have to make sure to send me some notes. <laughs> yeah, dude. No, no. So, so I promise, man, we're not going to get too nerdy into this, but um, I think it's a cool topic to talk about. And the reason why is because I think we do a real crappy job in paramedic school talking about acid base and what actually matters. And, and, and so what I want to start off with is just the topic of, of pH. And in one of the classes I do, I do this class called uh, iatrogenic nagma in Houdini. And I start off the class by saying, what does pH stand for? And I get a ton of different responses. Everybody's got something different. So I'm going to throw it back at you, uh, David, Eric, and, uh, and Bradley. What were you guys taught that pH stands for? A, um, I forgot the um, an algorithm, no, not algorithm, logarithmic um, equation that um, has an inverse relationship with how much hydrogen there is. Um, and then that's the end of it. And I'm going to stop because <laughs> I've said all the big words I know. <laughs> an inverted algorithmic logarithmic I, equation. I checked off four words there that... that <laughs> I'm out the rest of this podcast. All right. All right. So, so let's, uh, let's switch let's over to uh, Bradley. Bradley, what does pH stand for? So, so I probably have an unfair advantage since I got a background in biology and chemistry. Oh, shoot. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you want me to wait or, or, or go ahead? Oh, no. Go ahead, man. So, it's the potential of hydrogen is what it stands for. Potential of hydrogen. Okay. David, what do you think? You just going to, you going to copy off of Brad's paper or what are you going to say? Absolutely not, but I can say if worse comes to worse, I do have the, the wiki up here and we could go through the whole wiki. But the immediate thing that I think about as soon as we say as soon as we say pH, I think about a pool. Uh, you know, and having to shake my little thing and see and make sure that the, the pool is good so I don't have burns associated with being too acidic or uh, uh, too alkalinic. So uh, that's where I'm going, and and we're going to see where we take it over the next hour here. No, no, and I I promise I'm not doing a, a stump the chump here. I just I just I'm curious because everybody's taught something different. I've heard the partial pressure of hydrogen. I've heard the potential of hydrogen. I've heard the power of hydrogen. I've heard the power of hydronium or hydroxyl, and it's interesting because uh, we use pH. You know, we say, oh, this patient's acidotic. Their pH is, you know, 7.2 or 7.1. And the way I was initially taught to interpret acid base is I drew a tic-tac-toe little square, right? And I would write acid, I would write um, uh, basic or neutral and then basic or alkaline. And then let's say your patient's pH is, is 7.2. Well, you go, all right, well, that's less than 7.35. So you'd put a check mark in the, uh, the acidic box. And then you'd say, all right, well, what's their CO2? And uh, maybe their CO2 is, is 20. And you go, all right, well, that's, that's a little alkalotic. They're blowing off some of that CO2. So you, you put a check mark in that box. And then you say, well, what's their bicarb? And their bicarb is, uh, is 18. And you go, oh, oh snap. Bicarb's supposed to be 22 to 26. That's on the acidic side. And so you put a little check mark in that box. And then you would say, oh, okay, well, uh, this patient is in a metabolic acidosis and they have a degree of respiratory compensation in there. But the problem with that is you still don't know which patients you need to give bicarb to. And uh, you're talking about some dependent variables in that. And so I started digging into acid base a little bit and looking into does pH, what does pH even mean? And so I want you guys to imagine I got a, a glass of water, right? And I don't really have a glass of water. I have a glass of Buffalo Trace here right now. But imagine I, I do have a, a glass of water and I got all these H2O molecules in there. And so an H2O molecule you got two hydrogen molecules, and then you got a water molecule. And in the purest form of water, what do you think the pH is? 
So what would you guys guess the pH is if I have absolutely 100% pure water? What would you say the pH is? Take a stab, man. <laughs> we'll just start. We'll just say seven. Seven. Yeah, I was going to say 7.0. Yeah, you guys are spot on. If I had no impurities at all and I just had pure water, the pH would be 7.0. And, and I know that because uh, Sam Ireland, my buddy with uh, Foam Frat, the, uh, the other co-founder, his wife is super picky about what water she drinks. And so I started digging into water a little bit. And, and water can have a pH all over the place. I mean, you can look at Evian is usually the most alkalotic, but um, you can start getting into some of the cheaper versions of water and they have a pH that's a little bit more acidic. And so what is that actually measuring? And this is interesting. I never knew this. And I always wondered, why is it that the more acidic somebody is, the lower the pH the number is. And so I want you to imagine you have, let's just say you have uh, uh, 10 million water molecules. All right, so you got 10 million water molecules. And out of those, one of those water molecules has a hydrogen that has disassociated from it. And so it's, it's gone off of the water molecule and it's gone on over to another water molecule and it's formed hydronium. Well, if you count the zeros in that, you end up with a pH of seven because you got seven zeros and it's the inverse logarithm of that. And so all we're looking at with pH is how many water molecules out of all of those in there, how many of those are disassociating their hydrogen and playing a game of hydrogen hot potato and taking the hydrogen off and putting it on another molecule. And so when you think about that and when you're like, wow, one out of 10 million, that's not that much. And it makes pH seem like a really silly thing to measure. And so I started looking into it because I've had patients that have a pH of, of 7.1 and they don't look as bad as another patient that I have that has a pH of 7.1. Have you guys ever seen that? Have you ever had a patient that's 6.8 with a, a pH and they look okay? Maybe it's a DKA patient. And then you got another patient who's like an emphysema COPD patient, respiratory acidosis, who's got a pH of 7.1 and they, they, they don't look as bad or uh, maybe they look different. And it, it, I started looking into this thinking, What's the difference between these two? And it seemed that as, as if metabolic acidosis made a sicker looking patient than a respiratory acidosis. And so I started trying to dig into that a little bit more. And so when we're taught pH, we're taught either uh, the Henderson Hasselbeck method, which is like the primary method, or um, you may have heard of the Stewart method. The primary method has been the henderson hasselback and that's where we look at bicarb and we say, well, if this patient's bicarb is low, then that means they need bicarb, and, and that means they're in a metabolic acidosis. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this back at you guys because I want to I wanna hear what you guys think. So I want you to imagine you have a patient that is in a DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, and you walk in and the patient's awake. Uh, maybe they're they're breathing about 35, 40 times a minute. And uh, you look and the bicarb is 15. And they got beta hydroxybutyrate. Uh, they're spilling over some ketones. Their, their glucose is 600. And you see that they have a low bicarb. Is there anybody here that thinks that that patient needs to receive bicarb uh, purely off the basis that that bicarb is low? What's your thoughts? I mean, um, just going off of like a lot of the AHA guidance and even some of the critical care education that is out there and depending on your, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, resources that um, compete for the care of this patient, but just for the bicarb being low, I would say it depends. However, from a medic's perspective, if the bicarb is low, my default is going to be administer bicarb because that's gonna be like, you wanna raise that right back up. Now, 
I know that might be a little bit of a loaded loaded answer because there's more to it, but the default would be to follow protocol. And if you can administer sodium bicarb. Yeah, no, no, you're spot on, Eric. And, and that's essentially what we're taught, right? So if I come in and I got a patient that has a potassium that's low, well, then I need to replenish the potassium, right? If I come in and I have a patient that's magnesium is low, I need to go in and I need to replenish the magnesium. I mean, whatever's low, you need to add something to it. And, and, and so before I get on to the next part of this, I just want to see if uh, Bradley and Bradley, I know you got a, what do you got a biology degree? You're a, you got a bunch of stuff there, but um, I, I just want to see if there's anything else you guys want to add to that before I get to the, uh, the next step of this. Well, maybe we should talk about electrical neutrality. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it, man. That's, that's spot on. That's exactly what I wanted to talk about. Uh, so, so keep going with that, man. So there are lots of things that your body can do, but your, your body likes to maintain a nice balance between positive ions and anions. So cations and, and anions. And you've got to look at that and your body likes to maintain that neutrality but I don't want to take away and steal from anything that you're going to talk about either. <laughs> no, man, still my thunder. So, so, so Bradley's spot on. So you have something called electrical neutrality. And I think of it like, you know, if you're, if you're bench pressing, you can't have way more weights on one side of the bench than you have on the other side, right? You had to have them equal on both sides. And so those both sides the one side, let's say, is cations, and these are positively charged ions. These are things like your magnesium, sodium, potassium, blah, 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 calcium. And then on the other side, you have your negatively charged ions. And the most abundantly charged extracellular anion is going to be chloride. And so we have to have electrical neutrality between both of these. And so there's something called the, uh, the gamble gram or norma gram, where you see uh, two bar charts and you see sodium and chloride right next to each other. And you have to have the same on both sides. So a normal serum sodium concentration is between 135 to 145 milliequivalents per liter, right? And then chloride is usually about 102 milliequivalents per liter. So what that means is that you have way more cations than you have anions. Cause I'm talking, let's just say that the most, let's just say that the average for your cations is, is 140, all right? So we got 140 and then we have a, a chloride that's 102. And so we got this huge, we got this difference between those two and we know it has to be filled with something. It can't just be empty because we have to have electrical neutrality. And so the other thing that makes up that gap right there is bicarb. So sodium bicarbonate, and I'm just going to say bicarbonate, bicarbonate is a weak acid. It is a negatively charged ion. And so, all right, so that makes up a little bit more of that spot, but we still have a space there. And that space is made up of things like uh, albumin and phosphate. Now, I want you to imagine, so we have this perfect electrical neutrality here. Let's say that these both are, are equal to each other. And now my patient starts to, uh, they start to burn fat instead of sugar. Let's say we have a, a patient that's in DKA. And so they start burning that fat. And they create things like beta hydroxybutyrate and acetone. Those are weak acids. And so those weak acids start to accumulate, not in the cation spot, not in my positively charged ion, but in the anion spot. They start to grow. Now I got two options here. I can either increase the amount of sodium I have or cations, or I can get rid of something in the anion section. And so because my brain doesn't like if I just increase the sodium level just out of the clear blue, it says, hey, let's try to get rid of something in the anion section. And so what it gets rid of is bicarb. It says I can dump bicarb because I can make bicarb if I want to. I, I got an unlimited source of bicarb. And so what your body does is it dumps 
bicarb and it makes room for that beta hydroxybutyrate and that acetone. It makes room for it. All right. So now I want you to imagine that we come in and we say, oh, no, this bicarb level is 10. We got to give some more bicarb. And so we give intravenous bicarb. What do you think the body does when we do that? We, I, Brad, I, see, I see Bradley, I see him mouthing it over there. What do you think the, the bicarb does when the bicarb got rid of itself so that way we can make room for the beta hydroxybutyrate and acetone? And then all of a sudden, we just decide that we're going to give bicarb to it. Oh, you're going to start overwhelming the system with more with more stuff that it's trying to get rid of. So you're actually uh, placing a more a bigger stress on the body. Yeah, exactly. It goes, you big idiot. I just got rid of all of this and I'm trying to maintain electrical neutrality. And you're you you clown. You just added so, bicarbonate to it and I just got rid of it. And so how do you naturally bring up the sodium bicarbonate level? Well, you, you get rid of the thing that was taking the space in the in the beginning, and that's your beta hydroxybutyrate and your acetone. And so uh, you do that by things like insulin and, you know, blah, 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 blah. But if you get rid of that, the bicarb comes right back up. And so when I'm teaching this uh, to whether it be new flight clinicians or in our, our foam frat paramedic refresher, I, I, I like to stress the point of electrical neutrality because it's so important. Um, the body is so much smarter than we are. And it says we have to maintain neutrality. And so it gets rid of that bicarb. And I like to think of that bicarbonate buffer system as buffering electrical neutrality, not buffering out hydrogen ions. And so if you think of pH as the dissociation of hydrogen from a water molecule. So just imagine you got this little hydrogen molecule and it pops off of uh, a water molecule, H2O, and it goes over to another water molecule. And that becomes uh, hydroxide, and then this one becomes hydronium, right? Um, the amount of times that that's happening inside pure water, that's what makes up a pH. And I used to go to soccer games with my dad when I was really younger in, uh, uh, when I lived in Florida, and there was a soccer team called the Tampa Bay Mutiny. And I remember sitting there in the audience watching like the whole stadium. And at any point, there was always somebody getting up to go to the bathroom. And then there's always people sitting down. Like next time you're at a stadium and I say this, but you know, COVID, we're probably not going to see this happen for a while. But um, if you look at a stadium, there's always people getting up and there's always people sitting back down. And I want you to imagine you just take a picture with your camera. So you take the camera and you go, and you take a picture and you say, how many people are sitting up versus how many people are standing down that or, or sitting back down. That is what, is what pH is. You're looking at the dissociation of the hydrogen from the water molecule. And so we call pH a dependent variable because it's dependent on three things. And there's only three things that change your acid base. And so the first one is your CO2. So if your CO2 goes up, it makes that high, that hydrogen molecule want to dissociate from oxygen uh, more regularly. Uh, the other one is your strong ion difference. And that's the difference between your sodium and chloride. And then your third one is your weak acid. If I throw something like a beta hydroxybutyrate or acetone in there, it's going to make that dissociate faster. So my point in saying all of this is that the pH is kind of useless. I, I don't, I don't want to say it's completely useless, but it's kind of useless because it's a dependent variable. And so our attention is almost better spent looking at the things that change that pH, because that's going to give us a better picture of how our patient is doing clinically. So I'm going to give you an example. So I want you to imagine that, uh, let's say we take Eric and uh, we stop Eric from breathing. Let's say we paralyze him. And we put a high flow nasal cannula. Why is, why is David smiling so much when I say that we're going to paralyze Eric? He looks like he's real happy about this. <laughs> you know, hey, it's it, it, why not, right? Just say, hey, it's, it's, it's for science. It's this for is, science. It's for science. Eric, you're dedicating your body to science, okay? Yeah. yeah. So, Eric, so, Eric, we give you, uh, 
we give you a sedative and we give you some rock aronium, and then we put you on a high flow nasal cannula. So you're oxygenating, uh, your body's still perfusing normally, but your CO2 is elevating. I'm curious, Bradley, what do you think is going to kill Eric first? If we're oxygenating him, his circulatory system is still running fine, but we just are accumulating CO2. We put him in a respiratory acidosis. What's going to kill Eric? Well, as long as he's oxygenating, he's good. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so you don't really see, and I don't want to say never, but you don't really see patients dying from a respiratory acidosis. You see that, why do patients die from respiratory? They don't die from respiratory acidosis. They die from hypoxemia, right? Or they die from a uh, uh, hemodynamic compromise because we're, we're trying to ventilate an, an asthmatic and they, they can't uh, exhale and we're, we're, air, we're a breath stacking and we, we cause hemodynamic compromise. But you don't see people purely die from a hypercapnic respiratory failure. And so your CO2 can get pretty damn high before you ever run into issues with, with pH. But that's interesting because that's different than a patient who has a low pH due to an increase in weak acids like beta hydroxybutyrate or a patient that has an elevated anion gap. And so that is what I like to dive into because it's just very interesting that the, the pH doesn't necessarily correlate with the patient's presentation and what they look like. All right. I've been talking so, a little bit now. So, so I want you guys to, uh, I want you to come back and I want you to tell me I'm full of crap here. Go ahead, David. Uh, no, I, well, I can't. You're, I, go ahead, David. I'll let you go for it. Or Eric. Well, I'm no, I was just going to, I was just going to do what he said and tell him that he's full of crap, but uh, he's, he's really not. Uh, but I, I do want to get into that just a little bit because we've gotten really kind of into the science side. And one of the things that I want to take a look at is because a lot of what we're talking about in the field, uh, there are some that do not have the resources to get to these numbers, like the bicarb levels and such like that. So we have patient presentations, as you mentioned, uh, some of them may be, you know, the DKA, uh, you know, there's obviously many different uh, causes uh, from toxins and stuff that, that may put us in this condition. So uh, let, let's take a look real quick into the patient presentation that we're going to get if we don't have the ability to get uh, some of these numbers through our labs. And, it, and also talk about how some places are utilizing those different devices to get those in the field. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So all right, so here's here's the best practical example for somebody who doesn't have the ability to see what uh, a patient's VBG or ABG is. So I want you to imagine you have a, a sick asthmatic, and, and and you don't want to have to intubate an asthmatic patient because uh, then you take that arrow that narrow caliber airway and you make it even narrower, right? So if I have a sick asthmatic patient that is is forcing me to intubate them. I'm okay with letting that CO2 ride a little bit higher in order to not compromise hemodynamic values. So if I have to, if I, if my goal is, Hey, their, their end tidal CO2 is too high. I got to try to increase my minute, minute ventilation to blow that off. I'm going to end up as a situation where I'm giving too much air and they're not able to blow that all off. And that's where you start ending up with patients with pneumothorax or patients with increased air trapping. So that's the type of patient that I'm okay letting their pH ride a little bit lower, letting their CO2 ride a little bit higher while I'm waiting for the medications to work. And so I always say our goal with sick asthmatic patients is to not kill them with mechanical ventilation while we're waiting for the medication to kick in because that's what's going to ultimately make the difference. And so that patient's going to be a little bit different than uh, my DKA patient where I don't want them to run a little bit high with an end CO2. If I got a sick DKA patient, I got to keep them exactly where they were, if not lower. Um, otherwise, they're, they're going to decompensate super fast. 
how are how are some of these values? Because I, I do know that there's some services, whether it's the AirMed side or not. What are some of the uh, sources that we're using to get some of the lab values outside of uh, the hospital? Yeah. So 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 you know your your most simplistic one is going to be your end tidal CO two. So if you got your end tidal CO two and you walk in. You put the patient patient on a nasal cannula and title CO2 and you see it's it's uh it's 15, you probably should keep them around 15. That's probably doing a a good uh service to their pH. Now, the difference between your your end title CO2 and your PACO2 could be very significant, right? So when we're talking about end title CO2, we're talking about a byproduct or a end measurement of what the source is. And the source is their PACO2. So let's just say I have a patient that has a PACO2. And when I say PA, I mean, that's the concentration inside the arterial blood of CO2 of a 55. That doesn't necessarily mean that my end tidal CO2 is going to be 55, right? Because it has to go from the blood, through the alveoli, out the airway, out the mouth, and then get measured. So I could have a PACO2 of 55, but I could have an entitled CO2 of, of 25. And there could be a significant gradient between the two, uh, depending on perfusion and depending on uh, how the patient's airway is and whether the patient has secretions or blah, blah, blah. And, you know, that's what we call a VQ mismatch. Now, when we're looking at the PACO2 and we're looking at uh, the uh, the different labs and the pH, uh, my program, I work for Lifelink3, uh, we use something called the EPOC, and that's a point of care lab testing. And, and we don't draw off of uh, the arteries. We draw off of the veins. We get a VBG, but it gives us a good idea. What is that discrepancy between what is in the blood and then what we're exhaling? And that starts uh, us. It starts the ability for us to form that mental model of what do we need to do? Because usually, if you saw an end tidal CO two, you'd be like a, a fifteen. You'd be like, okay, I gotta slow down the respiratory rate, right? I, I see an end tidal CO two of fifteen. I gotta turn down the respiratory uh, rate, or I have to uh, decrease the minute ventilation. But that's not necessarily the case because that end tidal CO two of fifteen could correlate to a PACO2 of 55. And so there's a huge gradient between the two. I know Eric was going to bring up something just a minute ago, so we'll come kick it back to him. Yeah, yeah. what's up, Eric? No, um, so, and, and that's that's kind of where I'm at. I'm with David on this. Um, some resource-limited settings where you have those different patient presentations, because I've never thought about that, that a respiratory acidotic patient could look way different than a metabolically acidotic patient. Now we were talking about uh, DKA patients and stuff. Have you, just because where you live in the time of the coronavirus, have you yeah. seen any issues and any um, any weird presentations with coronavirus? Because it's been causing not only respiratory problems, but I know it also impacts the metabolic. Uh, it, it affects downstream in the metabolic zone too. Yeah, so the so the thing with COVID nineteen patients is you don't want to intubate somebody purely off of a PAO two, and so when I say PAO two, I'm talking P capital A O two, and that's um, I should I should I should say the P capital A is the alveolar, and the P lowercase A is what's actually in the blood, and so you don't want to intubate somebody purely off of their PAO two or their SPO two. What you want to look for is uh, the patients have that have a PACO2 that's rising because that's a patient that's leaning towards, I'm getting tired. They're not breathing as fast. Their end tidal CO2 is, is starting to accumulate. Now, COVID-19, as much as we all think it's a, a pulmonary disease, it's actually more so a vascular disease. And the reason I say that is because uh, patients with COVID-19 lose the ability to have hypoxic vasoconstriction. So right now, if I go and I put a big old booger in the side of, of uh, Bradley Dean's lung and I, I put a big uh, mess of uh, secretions in there, that side of the lung is going to go, dude, we don't have any oxygen over here. We need to constrict. 
And so they constrict. Why? They constrict to shunt blood over to the good lung. And they say, hey, we are really out of commission here. We're going to constrict down and we're going to take all of that blood and we're going to shunt it over to the good lungs over here. And that way you, you, you bring your oxygen over to where the hemoglobin is and your hemoglobin to where the oxygen is and it can off and it can unload and it can, it can circulate through the body. Well, if you didn't have that ability, Let's say that, you know, let's say David has a big old right-sided pneumonia, but he loses the ability to have vasoconstriction. Then what happens is you're, you're perfusing an area that's not well oxygenated, and then your SpO2 starts to go down. And so when you look at a patient that has, you know, COVID-19, and, and from my understanding of it, and I don't claim to be an expert on this by any means, um, but what happens is they lose that ability to have that hypoxic vasoconstriction. And so your SpO2 does drop because you're circulating blood through unoxygenated lungs. And so you don't want to intubate somebody purely because of that, because you can have this, this, uh, you know, and they call that, I hate the term, but it's like happy hypoxemic patient um, that is mentating appropriately, but their SpO2 is down in the crapper, right? And their end tidal CO2 is maybe normal. But as soon as you start seeing that patient go into a respiratory acidosis, they're not compensating for that no longer. And uh, that's the patient that may lean towards intubation. As much as we want to avoid intubation, if you start seeing that, that PaCO2 rise and you start seeing the pH come down a little bit, uh, then you start leaning towards, hey, this patient's getting tired and maybe we need to intervene now. And I, I hope that answered your question, Eric. Yeah, yeah, no, it does. Um, because I think that was one of the major concerns with, uh, with understanding just the COVID-19 profile of the patient because it's not... Um, it's not two dimensional like we tend to like think it is just because we read it on an article somewhere. Um, yeah. I had um, I had one other thing too. Just since we're talking about this um, now, the AHA recommendation still has treating the H's and T's uh, during cardiac arrest or even afterwards and stuff. Um, what have you seen any guidance or any material that you've read about um, dealing with acidosis? Because what I found interesting is there's been some studies like your body's becoming acidotic because it's compensating and there's an argument that just blindly giving sodium bicarb can actually knock out compensatory mechanisms and i don't know if you have come across that at all either yeah that's a that's a great point so so the uh, ha actually came out and they said we no longer recommend the routine use of bicarb in cardiac arrest i mean that's it's, it's that's word for word exactly what they said so there's a, that means that there's a couple of reasons maybe when you would give sodium bicarb for cardiac arrest, but it's not routine. It's not just because, hey, this guy's been down for a few minutes. We need to give it because of a prolonged downtime. So then you have to ask yourself, well, what are those reasons when you would give sodium bicarbonate? And for me, um, you know, think about a patient that like they're not that common anymore, but uh, somebody who overdosed on a tricyclic antidepressant. And, and you're giving it not because of the bicarb. And I always stress that it's not the bicarb, it's because of the sodium. Uh, TCAs are sodium channel blockers. And so you're giving it because that's that's an amount of sodium that you have. Uh, most ambulance co you know programs don't carry 3% sodium. Um, so you're giving that for that specific reason, but you're not just giving it because that patient's been down for a prolonged period of time. And, and when they came out and said, we no longer recommend the, the routine use of bicarb, you know, I don't like to rub that in people's faces, but typically, you know, imagine like all three of us are on a code and, and Bradley and, and Eric and David, and, and we say, Hey, do you guys have any other ideas? And, and uh, David says, yeah, you know, maybe we could get some sodium bicarb and we say, all right, yeah, that's fine. And, and I never, I never say to somebody, no, that's a dumb idea. That doesn't make any sense. And there's no scientific, scientifically uh, reason for us to do that. I just say, all right, because it, honestly, it's not going to make anything worse. And it's not a hill that I'm ready to die on. Like if somebody says I want to get bicarb, that's completely fine. Whatever. Yeah. And that, that was the only thing was um, you just have, 
I mean, I, I, I started EMS in 2002. Um, so we've always been told, you know, you just start throwing everything at the patient, you know, yeah. um, went from there from Bertillium to, um, when we still gave Bertillium to sodium bicarb, whatever, it, whatever it took. Yeah. And you know, the problem is, is, is so there's two different type of working environments. You have a kind environment and then you have a wicked environment. And EMS is the epitome of a wicked learning environment. And the reason why is because of feedback. It's, it's delayed and sometimes it's completely wrong. <laughs> and so, you know, imagine we're running a code and, uh, and, and you say, hey, we should give some bicarb. And we say, all right, let's do it. We push bicarb and then we get a pulse back. And, and Eric's saying, holy crap, I am the master of resuscitation because I just told everybody to get bicarb and then we got a pulse back right away. And we want to correlate the last thing we did with whatever we see in front of us. And, and that feedback can be, could be completely wrong. It could be nowhere near scientifically correct, but that's what we see. You know, I could say, hey, I have this weird thing, guys. Whenever I see a patient that's in cardiac arrest, I go up and I tickle their toes. And, and I've noticed that, you know, two out of three times, uh, these patients end up coming back. And so that's my thing. It, and it's called confirmation bias. And we, we know that that exists where you want to correlate the last thing you did with whatever effect you're seeing in front of you. Uh, but you, you really can't. And you notice that the people that are in the know and the, the clinicians that can actually perform a critical appraisal of a reflection of a call that they did, they don't do that, right? They say, hey, that could have been a ton of different things. It's very unlikely that that last thing I gave is what actually made the difference. And so, oh, and, oh go ahead, sorry. Uh, no, no, the example, and it's, it's tremendous. This is just one example that I have, and it's completely, you know, as soon as I start, you'll, you'll completely understand, but I got into a conversation with somebody at one point in time and they swore up and down the Trendelenburg position was the end all be all. And, uh, you know, like, hey, th you have to put those legs up and get them up as high as you can, whatnot, and that's going to bring the pressure up. But I'm like, well, what else did you do? It's like, because they're like, I've seen it work. I'm like, well, you know, we started bilateral IVs, gave dopamine, and and put a feed up. Well, yeah, no, no joke. You shrunk the pipes, you filled them full of fluids, and you know what what really worked on that. And and we know that the fluids are going to increase it, but it does take time because it's you know we're not dumping all that in, and it still has to go through the the systemic circulation, same thing with dopamine. And so, yeah, we definitely do see that last thing kind of be that one is like, well, I'll put the feet up. Well, yeah, that sounds great. But even Dr. Trendelenburg himself, Frederick uh, Trendelenburg said, hey, don't do this. It's not what you think it does. And you know, yeah. that was many, many years ago. And it still took us up until even here recently. And we still have people doing it. But, but could it be that the negative pressure ventilation was increased because all the stuff pushing up on the diaphragm Eh, never mind. <laughs> no, I know where you're going, that's, man. That's exactly, that's exactly what Dr. Trendelenburg said uh, back in the 1800s. And yet we still, in the 2000s, did it. So. Well, all right. So here's the thing. So out of all the crap that I just spewed out, is there anything that you guys think is absolutely ridiculous? It doesn't make any sense to you. You had me at electrical neutrality. <laughs> <laughs> I think Bradley's just into the episode. <laughs> uh, I, I tell you, I tell you where the big gap is: is the fundamentals of acid-base balance seems to be more heavily weighted on the paramedic side of the of of life than it is advanced EMT, which I know is not used that much across the fifty states, and EMT almost to the point that it frightens them to even think about it. As soon as you say the words acid-base balance, BQ mismatch, all that stuff, they're like, oh, don't worry about that stuff. That's pathophys. Um, read it in a book. Go watch a YouTube video. Um, there is this YouTube video I watch. I kind of like watching stuff where scientists explain um, complex things first to like a five-year-old, then to a 15-year-old, then to somebody who's going to school, and they just kind of gradiate. How would you explain to an EMT uh, if you don't mind, you know, going into that, the value of the acid-based balance, balance role, even in what they're doing on their end. Yeah, no, that's such, that's such a good question, Eric. And so, so I, I, I don't mean to, 
I tried not to talk about our our product, you know, the the foam for at refresher. But one of the things that we do in our our refresher is there's no levels, right? So if you were an EMT basic and you said I want to take this this national registry refresher, you would take the same exact class as a paramedic. And if you were a critical care paramedic, you would take the same exact class. And the reason why, and, and obviously they, they lead into more advanced topics, but when you're talking about acid base, the body doesn't change its physiology based off of who's doing the assessment. It's the same fracking thing, no matter who's doing the assessment. And I, I had somebody recently called me and said, hey, I've never needed to know the, the science behind lactate in my entire career. Why do I need to know it for this refresher course? And it's not that you that you need to know it. It's the fact that it doesn't change, right? I mean, and, and this sounds cliche, but your scope of practice doesn't change your scope of knowledge. You should know how the body works. It doesn't change based off of an EMT basic or a first responder. And the only thing that changes is the way we explain it. And if you can explain it in a way that everybody gets, then, then that makes a lot of sense and everybody digests it. But we have this idea and we have this preconceived notion that uh, we can only learn up to our pay grade or our, our patch on our shoulder. And I honestly, I think that's a bunch of BS, man. I don't think that that makes a lot of sense because physiology does not change. It's the same thing. So if I'm a first responder, and I show up and I got a patient that, you know, and I don't know what first responders, you know, all over the world can do, but let's just say you take a blood glucose and it's 700 and your patient's breathing super fast. You got to say, hey, this guy's breathing fast because he's trying to compensate for whatever the sugar is doing. And I don't know if it's a DKA or whether it's a, you know, HHNS or whatever. But there's something going on right now. And this patient's trying to blow off a bunch of CO2 to make up for something. And you can't discredit that knowledge there. And whether you have the lab sitting in front of you or whether it's just something you observe that creates a secondary data point that you use to create a decision that you use to make for to go forward in your, your, your uh, intervention process, um, it doesn't matter. Because it's the same physiology, no matter what. And, you know, you ima imagine a, like a car, you know, and there's something wrong with a car. And somebody says, well, I, I, I can't diagnose that because I am only used to this type of engine. And somebody says, well, I can only do it because I'm used to fixing air conditioners. It doesn't matter. The car is still, there's still something wrong with the car, no matter what your specialty is. And the first person to figure it out is the person that's going to be able to make the most difference in the patient or in that car. And so that's the main thing is, is not limiting yourself to a certain, uh, I don't know, a set of knowledge skills or uh, things that you should be able to know, say, Hey, I should know as much about the body as possible. Now, Maybe I can't do everything I want to do about it. Maybe I, I can't cut a hole in this person's neck and, and do a, a cricothyrotomy or a chest tube or put this patient on a ventilator. But, but God, I can know what's going on. That's, that's completely different than uh, the scope of practice. And sorry to get yeah. on the soapbox there, but, but that's the main thing I would say going forward with that is that the physiology doesn't change no matter what your patch is. Well, and this is what I'm going to say to that as well is, is you asked a minute ago if this just made absolutely no sense. And it does make no sense if you keep that thought of the cookbook style where we have body system A, disease process A, treatment A gets outcome A. And that's all you worry about. Mm -hmm. This gets us out of that realm of thinking like that and gets us into actual critical thinking capabilities. Like you said, it's like, you have a low bicarb. So what are you going to do? You're going to pull the brown box down and give it to the patient because that's what the protocol says, but that's not what the patient needs, you know, looking deeper into what those uh, cases are. And, and, you know, again, this could apply across all levels because, you know, with the, the needs of the services right now, there are plenty of them that are running with EMTs out on the road that are going to have the critical patients and they have to have the ability to identify something and realize that what's going on and get them to the facility that they need for the definitive care. 
And the more that they know, the more that they can pass that along. I mean, how, some of our best treatments, you know, especially for close to facilities, is just being able to convey that message to when they come through the hospital door, they're already ready. And to have that amount of knowledge, like, look, this guy's in DKA, he's blowing this stuff off and he's maintaining pretty well, but these are some of the things that I'm thinking. Hey, you know, you get that information and able to process through it, then that patient's you're you're creating a better advocacy for that patient just because of that knowledge. Yeah, you know, I, it's it's interesting because all right, so so do you have kids, David? I do. <laughs> How many? Seventeen kids? and twelve. Seventeen and twelve. So so I'm guessing your kids have probably irritated you sometime in their in their life. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that they've done something that that have, has made you uh, upset and maybe it's visibly obvious that they've irritated you. Right. And so let's say when they were younger, let's say they didn't clean their room and or they messed something up or they they left a screwdriver out in the yard. You hit it with your lawnmower and you got real irritated with them. Right. I remember my dad he used to always get irritated when we'd leave stuff out in the yard and he'd hit it with the lawnmower and <laughs> frack up his blade and and he'd be real mad. Right. And and you would get upset and maybe it was obvious that you were upset about it. But let's say that uh, your kids do something a little bit more extreme. Let's say that they go and they uh, let's, let's, let's say you're, you find out that your son got arrested or I don't know if you have a son or a daughter, but let's say you find out your son got arrested and uh, you find out it was for doing drugs or something, or he stole something, right? You're going to still get very upset about it, but the degree is a lot more based off of what caused that that feeling, that frustration. And so if I were to say that your uh, degree of frustration was the pH, and then the independent variable was what caused you to become frustrated, yeah, you still got frustrated with that screwdriver that you ran over with your lawnmower, but it's a lot different than the frustration that you feel when you find out your son got arrested for doing drugs. And so that's how I think of pH is it really depends on what causes that pH. So I can look at you and I can say, hey, I can see he's obviously frustrated right now. But what caused that frustration is so much more important than just purely me looking at you trying to figure out why you're frustrated. Does that make sense? Very much so. Very much so. I'm, 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 dude, I'm, I'm shooting off the cuff here. I'm coming up with this, this illustration on the spot. But that's how I think of pH is it. Why is that pH frustrated? Why is that pH changing? And it depends because uh, the CO2 rising from a respiratory acidosis, that's like hitting a freaking screwdriver with your lawnmower. You finding out that your kid just got arrested for, for smoking crack that is a metabolic acidosis and it's a completely different looking patient. Um, but you're still frustrated, uh, nonetheless, if that makes sense. Very much so. So, uh, probably one of the few times that an hour worth of metabolic acidosis can actually be fun. Uh, and my kids will absolutely love. So my wife and I podcast, we, we commonly use them. And so they're going to be glad to be in this one and know, um, that it wasn't years ago when they didn't clean their room. Um, if we were to go down there right now, it would be a problem as well. And that's why we don't, that's why they have their area. So, um, Tyler, it's, it's been a, a tremendous honor to have you on here. If you would kind of let people know how they can get a hold of you, if they want to continue this topic or really anything else, uh, how do they get a hold of you and, uh, any last thoughts from you? Yeah. Yeah. So guys, thanks so much for having me on. You guys are doing a fantastic job with this podcast and um, very privileged to be asked to come on. Uh, so if you guys heard anything that you, you thought was somewhat helpful, uh, you can reach out to me, Tyler at foamfrat.com. That's F O A M F R A T dot com. Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter at Christofoli 88 and, uh, <laughs> I, I guess I should probably spell Christofoli. So that's C H R I S T I F U L L I 88, the year I was born. And uh, 
and that's on that's on Twitter. And if you guys need anything, if you have any questions, if you want to tell me I'm full of it, uh, please reach out. Uh, Bradley, Eric, and and David, thank you guys so much for having me on, and I hope to talk to you guys soon in the future. Uh, we certainly uh, certainly would love to have you uh, back. Uh, probably about something other than metabolic acidosis. I think we can only do that maybe once a year. Uh, Cause you know, again, but that is the thing that brings everybody to the paramedic program. They, they want to know about solely this. So uh, let's send it over to North Carolina. Any last thoughts from you, Bradley? No, I, I really appreciate the, the discussion and, and this is great to be able to have some clinical stuff in here. Maybe next time we can do VBG versus ABG. Ooh, I like it. And you know, you had him at electrical uh, neutrality. That's, that's all you need to know from Bradley. <laughs> He, he quit listening after you said that. <laughs> let's, let's go to the, the West side then. Uh, any last thoughts from you, Eric? Um, yeah. Um, acid-based balance doesn't have to be as intimidating as, um, as everybody makes it out to be. It's nice to, like, I learned a lot from this. Like, there were some concepts that I just wasn't introduced to that I didn't go into. It is really interesting to get into this information. So I highly suggest that people are interested in this that if you're an EMT or paramedic school, maybe don't go down the wormhole just yet. Wait until you're out and then start going into it because it, you, can, you can wrap yourself around the depths of it, but this is still really great knowledge that you need to know in order to assess and treat your patients. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And thank you again, Tyler, for everything. And uh, just uh, letting everybody know that Tyler is getting ready to go to the Pursue Outfitters website and make sure and get a red extra medium EMS handoff shirt. So don't forget to uh, reach out to PursueOutfitters.com, the EMS uh, front slash the EMS handoff for all of your EMS gear. As we conclude today, we'd love to say that we always look forward to recording these episodes and engaging with each of you. However, without your feedback, we do not know what you're thinking. So please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on your favorite EMS Today by Jim's podcast platform. And again, that is Apple, Google, and most recently Spotify. You can also find us on video at YouTube. Uh, you can also find out all about us, Eric, Bradley, myself, on our website at the emshandoff.com. You can find us through our very interactive community here recently very interactive even during this podcast itself on facebook at the ems handoff and uh eric has us up and going on instagram at the same name so on behalf of my co-host eric and bradley this is david take care stay safe and always remember the value of your ems handoff